so today we'll discuss about this very important topic that is constrictive pericarditis so uh, one of the rare thing about constrictive pericarditis is that uh, it is also known as pix disease okay. so pix disease is also another name for frontotemporal dementia but yes constrictive pericarditis is also known as pix disease although it is a unpopular word for constrictive pericarditis so uh, we'll first start with uh, a case then we'll discuss about the constrictive pericarditis so uh, we have this patient who came to our ward uh, with chief complaints of fever on and off since 12 months uh, swelling in bilateral feet on and off since 10 months there is shortness of breath on and off since 10 months and abdominal distension on and off since 8 months okay uh, and uh, we have elaborated the history and According to the patient, he was ap apparently asymptomatic 10 years back when he started having fever, which was non-documented although, but it was associated with evening rise according to the patient and not associated with nausea, vomiting and chills or rigor. The fever used to relieve on taking medications and then recur again. There is also a history of swelling in bilateral feet on and off since 10 months, which is painless and aggravates on standing and improves on lying down and on taking medicines which increases the urine output and there is also a history of markings of slippers on the feet which suggests that there is spitting edema uh, there is no history of any calcium channel blockers intake uh, the patient also complains of shortness of breath on exertion since 10 months insidious in onset which occurs on climbing two to three mount of stairs or running and relieves on taking rest but there is no history suggestive of orthopnea or TND. Uh, the patient also complains uh, about abdominal distension on and off since eight months, which was insidious in onset and gradually progressive. Uh, and it was associated with pain in right hypochondrium and there is not associated nausea and vomiting. Uh, the swelling used to relieve on taking medicines, which increases the urine output. Uh, with these complaints, the patient went to a private hospital uh, eight months back where 2D echo was done and he was told that there is water around the heart uh, which needs to be drained. So a pictal catheter was inserted uh, and uh, fluids were sent for biological, biochemical uh, parameters testing and he was told that he had TB and ATT was started on the basis of that uh, although no steroids was started. Four months after taking ATT, he started having yellowish discoloration of eyes and urine, which may be, uh, which can be because of ATT induced hepatitis or maybe because of the right-sided heart failure. Uh, for this, he went to some private practitioner, uh, but the private practitioner stopped ATT and he was not taking ATT since then. Okay. Uh, uh, after generally examining the patient. The positive findings are JVP was raised 14 centimeter of the right atrium. Uh, on CBS examination, apical impulse is not visualized. Okay. Uh, on palpation, a fixed beat is palpated in the normal position. While on auscultation, we can uh, hear a normal S1, but as to uh, in, in as to the P2 component is loud with normal splitting and pericardial knock is heard in diastolic phase. Okay. Uh, while no murmur is being heard. So, uh, pericardial knock uh, is generally uh, listened in a diastolic phase. It's a diastolic sound. And we have this S1, uh, S2, again S1. Okay. So, uh, this phase is systole and this is diastole. So, we can uh, somewhere uh, listen to the pericardial knock here. Okay. So, we have... Uh, other diastolic sounds also we have opening snap pericardial knock tumor plop and then s3 and s4 so we have this sequence for these pericardial uh, diastolic sounds these are opt s3 and s4 okay so these are the diastolic sounds uh, first to come is opening snap then to come is pericardial knock then to come is tumor plop then to come is s3 and then to come is s4 okay Uh, the cause of pericardial knock is that when uh, there is filling of the ventricles, 
during early filling early phase of diastolic filling the ventricles keeps on filling but uh, during mid or late diastole it hits the thickened pericardium and uh, this produces a sound which is known as pericardial knock on abdominal examination we uh, have this slight right hypochondrial tenderness and liver is palpable 4 cm below the costal margin with a liver span of 17 cm probably due to the right heart failure okay. so uh, this is the case and uh, i told you just to have a basic idea about how a patient of constrictive pericarditis presents okay, so let us now start with a uh, theoretical discussion so constrictive pericarditis is a end stage inflammatory process of the pericardium and uh, in this uh, there is a, a formation of a thick and very thick and pericardium which prevents the uh, ventricles from stretching or uh, relaxing during the diastole so there is fibrosis adhesions thickening and calcification of the pericardium and it is a symmetrical process and affects all the chambers of the heart equally and it usually pro uh, presents with progressively right heart failure because since there is constriction of the right ventricle and, and left ventricle both but Uh, as we all know that if if there is rv failure that is uh, there is decrease in the rv output so less blood would go into la and uh, lv so definitely uh, the signs and symptoms of lv failure uh, won't occur in this type of patients the causes are uh, the most common cause is uh, the other causes are idiopathic uh, which is more common in developed countries then we have post cardiac surgery the uh, other causes can be post radiation trauma uremia sarcoid and rheumatic uh, pathophysiology is that there is restriction in mid and late diastolic filling uh, while early passive diastolic filling is increased okay so uh, if we'll see then we can divide the ventricular filling into three parts uh, early passive then we have late passive and then we have active filling phase in which there is atrial contraction so there is increase in this early passive filling while late and active uh, filling of the ventricles is restricted this is because when there is early passive filling uh, the ventricles expand and it will hit this thickened pericardium so there is decrease filling in uh, late passive and active phase okay while in cardiac tamponade there is restriction throughout diastole that is all early late and active filling is restricted in case of cardiac tamponade leading to the differences in the pathophysiology of cardiac tamponade and constrictive pericarditis now uh, let us discuss about the jvp in constrictive pericarditis so as we have already discussed that there is increase in early passive diastolic filling if we'll see now normal jvp it is a wave then we have c notch here then we have v wave then x wave v wave and y wave okay so in this y wave is because of early filling of ventricles okay while a wave is because of atrial contraction now in normal jvp a wave is more than v wave and x descent is more than y descent this is what a normal jvp looks like while in constrictive pericarditis a wave is equals to a v wave and uh, since there is more early filling of the ventricles so y descent will become prominent and y de uh, descent will be more prominent than x descent okay and uh, we will see this frederick sign in case of jvp in constrictive pericarditis that is there is a w pattern of jvp seen in constrictive pericarditis as we can see here so this is a normal jvp uh, in which we have a wave more than v wave and x descent more than y descent clear but uh, in case of per constrictive pericarditis as we can see here v wave is more than a wave and y descent is very much prominent as compared to x descent Uh, so this is a w pattern of jvp seen in constrictive pericarditis and it is known as a very important sign called as frederick sign then we have cosmol sign in jvp 
in constrictive pericarditis so uh, what happens in constrictive pericarditis is just uh, that this is a thickened pericardium okay uh, so this thickened pericardium prevents the intrathoracic pressures to be affected to affect the uh, intracardiac pressure so intrathoracic pressure would now not affect the intracardiac pressures so when there is decrease in intrathoracic pressures during inspiration and increase in venous return there is no decrease in intracardiac pressures because of the thickened pericardium so uh, since there is dec uh, dec increased venous return uh, uh, while the uh, intracardiac pressure doesn't decrease, so there is rise in JVP during inspiration. Uh, intracardiac pressure also falls along with the intrathoracic. In this situation, there is no fall in the intracardiac pressure. Okay, so the JVP rises as there is increase in venous return, but intracardiac pressure doesn't fall. Okay. So, small signs is inspiration all during inspiration. And it is due to the dissociation in intrathoracic and intracardiac pressures. Okay. Now, let us come to the clinical features of constrictive pericarditis. Uh, first of all, most of the patients present with right heart failure as uh, the case with the patient we presented. Okay. So, the patient presented to us with uh, pedal edema. He presented to us with uh, ascites. Okay, so most of the patients present to us with right heart failure. Left heart failure can be there, but uh, mostly they present with dyspnea only and orthopnea and PND are rare because of decrease in RV cardiac output. We can also see the ascites precox in constrictive pericarditis. Uh, ascites precox means that there is ascites before pedal edema in case of in cardiac case okay so normally pedal edema comes before ascites in a cardiac case but uh, in constrictive pericarditis ascites come before pedal edema the reason being that uh, we have this one of the hepatic veins uh, that opens after uh, perforating the pericardium into the IVC. Okay? So when there is constrictive pericardium leading to increase in portal hypertension, which can lead to ascites. Okay? Now, uh, it is very easy to misdiagnose constrictive pericarditis as cirrhosis with decompensation as we have uh, ascites first and then pedal edema. Okay? Uh, so, if you have seen any case with CLD with raised JVP, then constrictive pericarditis should be considered as a professional diagnosis. <laughs> then we have this broadband sign in constrictive pericarditis. Uh, what happens is that uh, there is systolic retraction of the 11th and 12th rib posteriorly, followed by a sharp rebound during diastole. And this is due to pericardial adhesions to the diaphragm. Okay. Uh, the investigations. Uh, in investigations in ECG, we can have this low voltage complexes and atrial fibrillation. And in chest X ray, we have calcifications in the pericardium. Uh, this is the ECG of our patient, which is showing low voltage complexes. Uh, so, for low voltage complexes, the criteria is that uh, uh, QRS should be less than 5 mm in all limb leads. And it should be less than 10 mm in all chest leads. Uh, this is the X-ray of a patient of constrictive pericarditis showing calcification around the cardiac borders. Okay. Uh, again, these are the X-rays showing calcification around the cardiac borders. Clear? Now, uh, we'll discuss very important uh, parameter that is 2D echo. Okay? So, uh, the 2D echo findings are very subtle uh, and uh, uh, they can be easily missed uh, 
if uh, uh, will not uh, see uh, them very deeply okay so 2d eco findings are very important for a constructive pericarditis uh, the first is thickened and calcified pericardium uh, so we can see on a 2d echo that the pericardium is thickened and it is calcified another thing that we can see is uh, enhanced intraventricular dependence that is septal bounce okay so whenever more blood comes into the right ventricle it will push the intraventricular septum to the left side while when more blood comes into the left side it will push the intraventricular septum to the right side and this will make the septum looks bouncy which is known as septal bounce okay and why this is occur because uh, there is no place for the ventricles to relax because of the thickened pericardium around them okay. Uh, we can have this exaggerated respiratory variation in mitral and right respiratory inflow velocity. Okay, so there is a, a lot of variation in mitral and right respiratory inflow velocity. When there is more blood flowing in the right side, there is compression of the, uh, there is pushing of the interventricular septum to the left side, which compresses the left sided of the heart and which will lead to the decrease in the mitral inflow. Well, when more blood flows on the left side, it pushes the interventricular septum to the right side, which leads to the decrease in trigastrate inflow. Okay, so there is uh, exaggerated respiratory variation in mitral and trigastrate inflow velocity. Another thing that we can see is elevated atrial pressures, dilated IVC, oh dilated God. hepatic veins, and by atrial enlargement. Okay, uh, another important things that can be uh, seen in a 2D echo is annulus paradoxes and annulus reverses. So we'll discuss annulus paradoxes and annulus reverses in the next slides. So I, I want to show you uh, GIF showing septal bounds. You can see here. So, uh, So I guess the video is not working. Uh, so uh, you can see here that this is an interventricular septum and it will bounce when uh, more blood is there in the tricuspid wall uh, to the left side and it will bounce to the right side when there is more blood in the left side of the heart. Okay, so this is a basically a four chamber view showing LA, LV. LARA, LV, and RV. And this is the interventricular septum. Okay. So this will bounce like this. Okay. Uh, now, uh, this is annulus reverses. What happens is that uh, we have uh, these two. First of the mitral wall, we have this medial wall and we have this lateral wall. So, uh, the lateral wall, uh, the lateral cusp of the mitral wall moves more than the medial cusp. Okay, so it is more mobile. And uh, when we have this tissue Doppler imaging of the mitral annulus cups, uh, the velocity we get is generally more than seven. Uh, and when we have this 
tissue depleted imaging of the lateral cusp of the mitral wall we get uh, the velocity is more than 10 okay but normally uh, the lateral is more than medial okay so a lateral e prime is more than medial e prime normally but in case of constrictive pericarditis since the pericardium is uh, covering the uh, heart from outside so the lateral wall uh, is restricted somewhat then more than the medial wall okay so we have medial e prime is more than the lateral e prime and this is known as annulus reversus okay so we can clearly see here that medial e prime is more than the lateral e prime and this is known as annulus reversus we can also see annulus paradoxus in case of constrictive pericarditis in which uh, uh, normally in constrictive pericarditis we have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction that is diastolic dysfunction is there okay uh, e and a are the parameters that we can go uh, find through the pulse wave doppler along the mitral wall okay now uh, e velocity is because of the passive filling of the ventricles and a velocity is because of the uh, active filling of the ventricles okay so uh, in diastolic dysfunction normally what happens is normal uh, e, e is more than a but in diastolic dysfunction e reduces and e becomes less, less than a okay this is a normal phenomena and uh, we normally uh deduce this e by e prime and uh, we'll come to know about la pressure and lv filling pressure okay so uh, e by e prime increases in case of diastolic dysfunction because la pressure and lv filling pressure increases but in constrictive pericarditis although la pressure and lv filling pressures are increasing but e by e prime is low despite high pressure because medial e prime is exaggerated okay. so this is the annulus paradoxus Okay. So annulus reversus means medial e prime is more than lateral e prime. Okay. And annulus reversus means that e by e prime although should be more, but it is reduced in case of constrictive pericarditis. Okay. Now CT scan for constrictive pericarditis. So CT scan is the most accurate measurement of pericardial thickness and calcification. Uh, as we and have already known that uh, calcification is best seen on the CT. Okay. Cardiac MRI. So cardiac MRI can detect LG that is late gadolinium enhancement. And the presence of LG suggests that active inflammation is going on and which indicates reversibility. So uh, if a patient of constrictive pericarditis is undergone a MRI, and we have we can see the lg there that means that active inflammation is going on and we can still give the steroids to reverse the process okay now cardiac catheterization in constrictive pericarditis cardiac catheterization would show square root sign and interventricular dependence uh, and we can clearly see uh, that uh, this is lv pressures and uh, the Lower one is RV pressure. So the pressure increases suddenly, the RV pressure increases suddenly during early passive filling. And at this point, it uh, stops from rising. Okay. And now it becomes almost static. These are late passive. And active filling phase as we know that late passive filling and uh, active filling is restricted in case of constrictive pericarditis okay so this is known as square root sign okay. so basically square root sign is that early diastolic fill, ventricular filling is unimpeded and abnormally rapid in case of constrictive pericarditis leading to uh, abrupt increase in the rv pressure but late diastolic filling halts abruptly, leading to 
almost a plateau rise in ventricular pressure, right ventricular pressure, leading to this sign, which is known as square root sign. Okay. And at this point, when the uh, early passive filling stops, we'll listen to this pericardial knock. Now, again, uh, this is a CAT study showing interventricular dependence. As we have already discussed, that when the uh, right sided blood is more, it will push the ventricular septum towards the left side and uh, decreases the left sided flow. And when left side blood is more, it will push the septum towards the right side, com uh, compressing the RV. Okay? So the pressure difference during normal condition or during a case of restrictive uh, cardiomyopathy is less, while the pressure difference uh, in constrictive pericarditis is more. This is known as interventricular dependence. Okay. Now the management is conservative by giving diuretics and salt restricted diet. And uh, we can go for a surgical pericardiectomy, which is the treatment of choice, but the procedure in itself has a high mortality. Now we'll discuss uh, what is the basic difference between constrictive pericarditis and restrictive cardiomyopathy. Uh, so, uh, constrictive pericarditis is basically a problem of pericardium, while restrictive cardiomyopathy is a problem of myocardium. Okay? So, prominent wire descent is present in constrictive pericarditis, while it is variable in restrictive cardiomyopathy. We can have paradoxical pulse in one third of patients of constrictive pericarditis, while it is not seen in restrictive cardiomyopathy. Pericardial knock is seen in constrictive pericarditis, but it is not seen in restrictive cardiomyopathy. There is equalization of right and left filling pressures because the uh, thickened pericardium pushes uh, all the chambers equally. So there is equalization of pressures, while uh, in restrictive cardiomyopathy, there is a difference of at least 3 to 5 mmHg. Pulmonary uh, artery systolic pressure, yeah, RVSP, right ventricular systolic pressure, is uh, more than 16 case of R RC in case of constrictive pericarditis. The square root sign is commonly seen in constrictive pericarditis, as we have already discussed. While in RCM, it is variable. There is respiratory variation in right and left sided pressures and flows, as we have already discussed. In case of constrictive pericarditis, while it is variable in restrictive cardiomyopathy, Ventricular wall thickness is normal in constrictive pericarditis as, as it is a pericardial disease, while the ventricular wall thickness is increased in case of restricted cardiomyopathy. Uh, the pericardial thickness is increased in constrictive pericarditis. It is normal in RCM. The septal bounce is present in constrictive, constrictive uh, pericarditis, while it is absent in case of RCM. The medial E prime velocity that we have already discussed is increased in CCP while it is absent in RCM. Okay. Uh, so, thanks a lot. And uh, we'll again come up with some other interesting lectures soon.